Everybody, um, my name is Tristan Smith. I'm a lecturer here at the UCL Energy Institute, and it's my job to chair this uh, evening's presentation. Uh, I will introduce Christoph in a second. I've got a couple of housekeeping notices. The first one is simply to point out what the uh, fire escapes are. So just at the back on the right, and also the entrance where you came in, and the front is where we plan to fire an answer here and think we follow UCL members and stuff as quickly as possible. Um, the, the process, I'm sure many people have been here before, but the process is simply to have um, a 45 minute presentation by Christoph and then about 15 minutes for questions. Please save your questions um, until that point so that you can keep this flowing. Um, and then afterwards, uh, there's a glass of wine and some um, food to eat upstairs. And you're very welcome to join us until about 7 30 when we hopefully make chunk out. Um, if you are here after 7 o'clock and you're not using a letter of staff, you must find a UCL member of staff to let you out because otherwise it sets off the fire alarm and causes problems. So please look for either um, Liz, my staff, or anyone else who looks like they, they might work here um, to help you because that's really crucial. I'll run my list at the end as well. Um, we've had some embarrassing instances. So finally, um, just to introduce Christoph. Christoph is a, um, we were just discussing what he just he, he said he was originally a physicist, but he's now an energy modeler. Um, and uh, is, is, is recently completed a PhD in a very related subject to his talk, um, and is now working in the Institute of Sustainable Resources as a research associate. Um, Thanks very much, Tristan, um, and thank you all for coming. Um, I'll get straight in. Um, because I might run over 45 minutes. Um, so just to give a, a brief outline as to um, what I'm going to be talking about, first of all, introduce this concept of peak oil. It's, it's often talked about, but um, it's quite a, a nebulous concept, which different people mean different things. So I'll try and discuss what I mean by it. Then look at why does anyone think that um, oil production is going to peak at some point, um, and then how they then model future produ oil production. Uh, and this is actually quite a tricky business, and I'll discuss where that might be. And then recently, the, um, peak oil has dropped off the, the popular discourse somewhat, um, and that's mainly due to um, the emergence of tight oil in, in North America. So I'll discuss tight oil in some, um, in some detail, and then come on to the initial question, which is, um, is peak oil finished? Um, so to introduce um, what's meant by peak oil, it means different things to different people. Um, and what I've tried to do here is, is, is focus on four key things which people sometimes use the word peak oil and they use to mean very specific things. So these are different quotes from, I've tried to focus on, on academic papers here. Um, so the first one, the first point there is um, the kind of the pure academic definition of peak oil, and that is a, a maximum level in oil production um, globally and a, and a subsequent, subsequent decline. Um, the, the, the next three aren't kind of are, are a bit more uh, fuzzy in, in what they actually mean, but um, they're kind of um, connotations of, of peak oil. The first one is that um, we're running out of cheap oil, um, we're entering a new price regime, um, oil prices are going to stay high and are going to continue to rise in the future. Um, that's kind of summarised by that statement, we're running out of cheap oil. Um, and then the, the second two, the, th the third, sorry, the, the, the last two there, the third and fourth point, are some of the more um, dramatic and um, popular ways in which peak oil arguments are um, frequently framed. So um, the first one is that um, we're going to get a mismatch in the future between um, rising demand and falling supply, and you're going to get a gap, and you're going to get massive price spikes. And uh, finally, the, the last one, which is uh, the name of an academic paper from not too long ago, um, relates this idea of peak oil and we're running out of oil. So um, a lot of people take peak oil to mean we're, we're going to run out of the stuff and we need to move away from it. And um, as I say, it's just, this is obviously a fairly controversial subject. Um, and it's just in, in, interesting recently um, from a the, the most recent um, special edition of energy policy, there were two, two it was a, a whole special issue done on oil, and two papers in it, one said peak oil is now complete nonsense, and it's clear it's nonsense, and the other one says that um, the evidence is actually, we, we've already reached peak oil, so not only is it a contentious subject, but there still seems to be huge um, amounts of disagreement within this, within this field. So I'm going to keep coming back to these four um, ideas of what we mean by peak oil. Um, but to help frame um, the, the peak oil discussion, um, it's worth looking at, at um, some of the, the projections which people have of, of, of future oil production. Um, so 
it's a it's a kind of a bit of a false dichotomy just to say that there's only these people that think oral reproduction is going to continue to rise in the future and some people say it's going to peak and, and decline away but there's a, there's a huge number of different projectors which kind of lie in the, in the in the range between these two between the two extremes but this does help to kind of make it easy to discuss so quite frequently um, the the ones who continue to increase are called the optimists um, they're, they're optimistic about where we're going with future production and the ones that say we're going to peak and decline away um, are known as the pessimists um, so uh, just to kind of really jump into to why is why is there this disagreement that that kind of huge discrepancy between people saying it's going to rise up to 100 million barrels per day and others saying it's going to peak and decline away to less than 40 million barrels per day um, in, in less than 20 years. And I think there's, there's four key aspects which really um, help to explain why there's disagreement on, the, on this issue. And the first three points here really come from the traditional makeup of, of who the pessimists are and who the optimists are. Um, the pessimists historically have been geologists. They've, um, they like focusing on supply side dynamics and, um, and looking at, at how much oil there is and that kind of issue. Um, the, the optimists on the other hand tend to be economists and they're, they're much more sanguine about um, what oil is and it's much more of a, a different concept and, and that really, dr really drives these issues. So, Geologists, the, um, the pessimists, say that, well, to, to model future oil production, you need to just focus on the supply side. Oil is a physical quantity, therefore, um, you can just look at supply, of, just by looking at the supply side of the oil market, that will let you know how much f production you're going to get in the future. Optimists, on the other hand, because they're economists, generally economists, sorry, and like to focus on, on the uh, demand side of things, so they say how many cars will there be in the future, and, and they say supply will be sufficient to match that. Um, another kind of thing following on from that is what will cause um, a, the peak in, in, in oil production if it does occur at all. So the um, pessimists, because they're geologists, because they focus on supply side dynamics, say any peak that cause will be caused by supply constraints where um, you can't keep producing, getting oil to come out of the ground, so you're going to get a peak. The, the economists, on the other hand, say, well, actually, if any, we don't think necessarily that any peak is going to occur, but if it does occur, it's going to be as much as function of, supply, of demand side dynamics as it is of supply side dynamics. The third point there is, is on, on what, what these two different sides of the date really mean about when they say oil. Um, the, the, the geologists say, well, oil is a physical quantity, there's a fixed amount in the earth that's not kind of being continually created, and therefore because it's a limited quantity at some point, it's inevitable that oil production is going to peak and decline away. The economists, on the other hand, say, well, actually, or what's important is the amount of oil you can currently produce, um, the amount which is economically um, recoverable currently, and that's a much more of a fluid concept. So if, if oil prices rise, they say the amount of oil you can produce will rise. If oil prices fall, they say the amount um, of oil you can produce will, will, will fall. Um, so you have this kind of economic quantity versus a geological quantity in, in your idea of what you mean by oil. And the final um, issue um, in, the, in the peak oil debate really is what, what people mean when they say oil. They say this is going to peak, but actually by saying oil they mean completely different things. Um, generally the pessimists say cheap oil is going to peak or conventional oil is going to peak, and the optimists say well actually all, you've got to look at all the different types of oil that there are. It's not just cheap oil, it's not just conventional oil. There's other types of oil which are just as important, um, and you've got to look at the whole spectrum of different types of oil when you talk about a peak. And that's this, this slide, I mean, it's, it's not the most interesting thing to talk about definitions, but it's, it's an incredibly important aspect to, to take into account with the peak oil discussion. Um, and if there's, there's various different definitions which can be used when you're discussing oil, but the most common and most frequently made distinction is between conventional oil and between unconventional oil. Unfortunately, there's not really any agreement amongst any of the academic or any other of the literature as to what, what distinction you make between conventional oil and unconventional oil. Um, there's three different ones I've given here. On the one hand, you can, you can say, well, actually, we're going to define conventional oil ba based on the properties of the oil which comes out of the ground. So, and there's the kind of the green bubbles there. It says any oil, when it comes out of the ground, which is less dense than water, is going to be conventional oil. Anything which is more dense than water is unconventional oil. Um, you also have what's called unconventional liquids, which are the which aren't, aren't really oil at all, you get them from coal and you get them from gas or, or, or bio liquids and that kind of issue. But generally, 
it's conventional oil and unconventional oil. The unconventional oil is things such as the, the oil sands or the tar sands in Canada or the extra heavy oil in Venezuela, or there's a huge amount of kerogen oil in the United States, which is also being produced in Estonia, and those are the unconventional oils. The yellow um, bubbles up there are the, if you actually want to define the distinction between conventional oil and unconventional oil by the geology of, the, of where you find the oil underneath the, underneath the ground. Um, the key difference between um, the geology works and the oil properties is that some of the, the ones which we can say are conventional oil here and in the green bubbles um, are found in, in very different uh, characteristic reservoirs. So a lot of conventional crude oil is found in quite localized oil fields. This is kind of like the North Sea or Saudi Arabia or something like that. The one difference is with tight oil, which we're going to discuss in much more detail later on, but tight oil is found over a very sp um, geographically diverse and spread out area, and so it's actually quite different from um, the, the discrete fields which you find for, com for other sources. So if you wanted to define the um, conventional oil by the geology, you say, well, we don't care so much about what the oil is like when it comes out of the ground. We want to define it by what, what the geology says the oil is like. And finally, you can get to a, um, a, de a definition which says we want to define oil by how you, how you produce it, how you get it out of the ground, and different, different ways in which you can produce oil. And the big difference here is that this is a kind of a, a technological definition, which means that um, if the oil is found offshore, and it's in deep waters, they say, well, that's not really, you can't really use conventional methods of production to get that out. So we're going to say that's an unconventional oil. So, for example, all of the stuff in the Gulf of Mexico um, would be defined as an unconventional oil under this, under this definition. Similarly, if it's an extreme environment, such as the Arctic, um, Arctic oil is likely to be just as light as any other, Saudi Arabian or um, North Sea oil, but it's quite hard to get to because of um, ice flows and, and such like. Um, so they say, well, that's, that's an unconventional oil. Um, the reason this is all important is that quite often when the, the, the pessimists say um, we're, we're going to get a peak in production, they actually mean it's quite narrow, narrow definition at the bottom, whereas uh, often whenever the optimists are talking about conventional oil, they will, they'll tend to favour the, um, the definition on the left-hand side of the green bubbles. The, the, the colour coding here is, is very deliberate. I much prefer the, the green and the yellow definitions over the red definitions, um, mainly because um, they, they're quite fixed in what they mean. Um, when it, the oil which comes out of the ground, which is less dense in water, is always going to be like that, and that definition is never going to change. However, whenever you have a more technological way of defining oil, as technology changes or e economics changes, um, your definitions might change. So it's a bit more of a fluid concept, and it's nice to have kind of firm def definition set in stone. So now to, to, to discuss why anyone thinks that that oil production is going to peak at all. Well, really this comes down to the behavior of an individual well. Whenever you first find uh, a nice new oil field, such as in the North Sea, you'll drill a well and the oil will come out of the ground um, under its own um, pressure. So you get, you get a pressure differential between the ground and the well which you just drilled, and that will force the oil out of the ground. And slowly over time, that pressure differential drops. Um, as the oil is produced, and also water will start to flow into that well, displacing some of the oil which is coming up. And therefore, slowly over time, for an individual well, you're likely to get less and less production um, of oil. You might get the same amount of liquids, but if half of it's water, then your, your oil production is, is lower. And the argument goes that, well, because individual wells peak, and, and a field is just a collection of individual wells, inevitably, at some point, your, f your fields are going to to go through this process as well. So you might drill um, 10 wells in a given field, um, and after the, after the first five will peak, the, the, the next five can't, can't kind of ma keep maintaining the level of production, and so eventually the whole field is going to start to decline away itself. Sim and that's kind of the, the behavior we can see in the, on the bo bottom right-hand diagram there. That's for the Brent oil field in, in the UK. You can see it reached a production in after a few years after it production initially started, and it's been declining away since. The slight blip is kind of an above-ground factor, um, which isn't particularly relevant for this discussion. Um, now, the argument continues that, well, because individual fields peak, and a country is just a collection of individual fields, then countries are inevitably going to peak at some point. Generally speaking, in a, in a country, you drill the, the, best, wheel, the best fields first, um, you dr drill the, the fields that give you the most production. And so you drill, you drill the first well, and that 
reaches its maximum production as it declines away, and then you have to drill a slightly smaller field, and a slightly smaller field, and a slightly smaller field. And because the biggest fields start to decline, no matter how many smaller fields you bring online, you can never kind of maintain this level of production. And inevitably, at some point, the whole country is going to go through this decline process. And finally, then um, a region is a collection of countries, so if countries peak, therefore regions peak, and then you can continue up to the global level, because countries peak, the, the whole world is going to peak at some point. Um, now, obviously this is, a, this is disputed, whether this argument truly holds, but that, that's kind of in a nutshell um, why, why some people think that production is going to peak. What an important thing to, to draw attention to here is that, although it might be controversial once you get up to aggregated scales, that it's inevitable that countries are going to reach a peak in production. It's not that controversial to say that individual wells peak and individual fields peak. Um, and this means that you might have an awful lot of oil underneath, underneath the soil, which you know you can produce, but you can't necessarily produce it as quickly as you might want to. So in the UK, for example, currently, there's about 7 billion barrels of oil still left, which we consider to be economically recoverable at the current prices and with current technology. However, we can see here for the past kind of 10 years or so, 15 years even, um, UK production has been in a kind of a terminal decline. So although there's lots of oil, it's going to take quite a while to get out of the ground. And that's not actually that controversial a statement because these are kind of constraints which are driven by the geology of, of the way in which um, oil production occurs and are often referred to as depletion rate constraints. And so bringing on to how the pessimists actually model future production in, over the long term, um, the, 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 the idea of these depletion rates is absolutely central to, to what they say, um, to, 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 the, to the method they use to um, produce these um, production profiles. So the process they use, first of all, they say, um, how much oil is there in a given region? And I've taken the most sim simple example here of saying, we want to model global oil production based on historical data and an estimate of how much oil there is globally. So there's a very good record, historical record of, of production globally. You then come up with an estimate of how much oil there is, and then you say, what shape is this, this production going to take? And examples given here are the um, uh, logistic functions, and just but driven by these three parameters, historical production, an estimate of how much there is, and the shape of production in the future, that will tell you where oil is going to go over time. And you've got to make sure that the area underneath the curve is equal to your estimate of how much oil you think exists. The top example there is from a recent paper which kind of shows the, the impact which the, the uncertainty in the amount of oil which you think exists has upon your estimated peak levels of production, when you think things will peak and where you think production will go afterwards. But the bottom right hand side is the, 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 the classic example of peak oil. Um, it's very hard to have a discussion on peak oil without mentioning Hubbard, who first put some rigour behind um, the, the modelling of, of oil production. And what he did was said, right, well, he just used exactly this process, but he did this a long time ago in 1956, and said, where's production going to get to, and when's, when's it going to peak, and at what level it's going to peak. And it's not very nice to go to old people's projections and say, well, it's terribly wrong, but it's, it's, it does illustrate a point. So he said, for example, that we would peak at about 12 billion barrels of oil per year, and currently we're up at about I think about 33 billion barrels of oil a year. So this was a fair, fair bit off what actually happened. Um, this isn't the only way of modeling production. Um, this is not the only way that pessimists model oil production. But generally speaking, they rely either on this curve fitting approach or on a pure supply side modeling approach. So you can use different functions. You can say, well, instead of a logistic function, let's use a triangular function, let's use a uniform just function or a Gaussian function or whatever function you want. And you can also have what they call a multi cyclic function where you have individual peaks in a given region or a different country and use that to project production. Often they don't do it at a global level. They'll say, well, we can model production in the UK and then we can model it individual countries across the world using this process and then we add up all of those those different uh, processes but generally speaking they're all just variations on, on this very similar theme this is very different from how the optimists model this kind of stuff which is what i mentioned at the beginning they focus much more on demand side variables they say how many cars will, uh, are they going to be in china in 2050 how much oil are they going to demand and therefore we're going to more or less assume that oil supply is going to be sufficient to, to meet that demand 
they sometimes go into a little bit more detail about this is looking back historically as to how optimists have historically uh, modeled this model production projections. They sometimes look at individual countries. So they say, well, let's we'll model non-OPEC supply in a little bit of detail, but then we'll just assume that all the OPEC countries are going to have sufficient capacity to bring on enough oil to make sure that we can always meet this this demand level, which which we specified from the from the, the kind of the bottom-up technology approach. And one of the the groups which is often accused of being an optimist um, is the IEA, and, and what I've done here on the, on the on the graph on the right is gone back to the earliest. Um, International Energy Agency out outlook from 1993 and seen what production projections they gave back then and gone through each, each kind of successive year as to when they produce a new projection and say where, where, where are they now, what's happened to the production projection, Where's, what's the change has been. And we actually see that the, the labelling of the IA historically as a, an optimist is somewhat justified because we have here the kind of the, the, the range and in, in where they think production is going to be and really actual production since 93 is, has more or less always been along the bottom of what they've said. I've always taken the central projections here from each year and even then we're, we're kind of towards the bottom end um, over, almost entirely across, across time. Um, it's worth pointing out that actually the, the, the optimists have got an awful lot better at modelling future oil production projections. They've, they've, they've acknowledged that these supply constraints are very important and have very important implications for how much oil you think you can produce. And so recently, the optimists, um, and again, it's this not just kind of a discrete group, but people who, who prefer to focus on demand side variables have become better at appreciating that geological constraints and supply side constraints are just as important as a lot of the demand side dynamics. And this is this is le this leads to a bit of a problem when it because the the the, the pessimists, so to speak, have, have resolutely stuck to this idea that curve fitting is the way to go forward in terms of producing projections. And um, really, I'm not a big fan of, of curve fitting at all. It's it it there's a there's a, a range of reasons there given there why why this might be. But really, to focus on the on the top one is that. Whenever we said people use logistic function to project projection production, um, there's no reason why you should use a logistic function. You can use any function. There's no theoretical basis as to what shape production is going to be when you when you model on an aggregated level, such as the country level. And often, quite often, symmetry is imposed. So they say that the rate at which you've gone up is equal to the rate at which you're going to go down in the future. And there's, again, there's no real reason why that should be symmetrical. And similarly. It reduces all functions down, all the kind of the, the 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 complications and the uncertainties in the oil market down to a simple function of time. It says that you can, you and you can model it on the basis of those two parameters: historical production and an estimate of the amount of oil there is. And really, the curve fitting isn't isn't up to the task of of producing very robust estimates of of how much oil we're going to produce. And that's because they've stuck so much to this idea that no, we, we've got to keep sticking with curve fitting, and it, um, it really doesn't help progress the, the peak oil discussion to any great degree. Um, but it's, it's evident that both the pessimists and the optimists haven't historically been particularly good at estimating future production levels. The hub from we saw from 1956 was half the level you should have been in the IAs has historically bumped along towards the bottom of where they say production should be. And the reason for this is actually it's, there's a huge number of uncertainties, as I mentioned, which, which can play into the into future production levels. And I've I mentioned five here uh, in particular. The first one there, how much oil there is, is going to be an important aspect as to how much oil we're going to be able to produce. But it's a very hard thing to know with any confidence how much oil there is, especially when you talk about issues such as we don't know what technologies are going to be in the future, we don't know how much we're going to be able to get from undiscovered oil because it's not been discovered yet, and it's a very difficult thing to have any confidence about. Similarly, we don't know how much it's going to cost to get out of the ground, and I'm going to show shortly this, this the, these can, production costs can change pretty rapidly and by quite a large degree. The macroeconomic drivers of, of demand are, are very uncertain. We don't know what's going to happen with car carbon emissions. Potentially, if we go to two degrees, we're going to use, need an awful lot less oil than if we went to five degrees. And similarly, for the, some of the unconventional oil production technologies, the unconventional liquids production technologies, we don't really know at what rate these are going to be able 
going to be able to take off, get off the ground and, and bring new production online. So to, just to, to give a bit more detail, sorry, sorry this graph hasn't come out very well. Um, the, the historic focus of a lot of the PIGO literature has been on resource uncertainty. Because the, the entire focus of the pessimists has been on supply side dynamics, they say, well, actually, and because historical production is a pretty well-known number, what they focus on is how much, oil, how much oil can we get out of the ground. And one thing that always kind of comes up in this discussion is that we don't really know how much oil the, the members of OPEC have. And this derives from, um, this is a historic um, record of, of the declared reserves by a number of the OPEC countries. So we can see in, in, in about the, the, the mid to late 1980s, a lot of these countries suddenly massively increased the amount of oil that we can produce economically, which, we could, which, which they declared as reserves quantities. And then this is interpreted by different ways by different people. Some people say this is completely unjustified. The original numbers were much closer to what you could reasonably say is, is a reserve volume. Other people say no, Previously, in the 1980s, these were, these were underestimated, and this is a much more reasonable estimate currently of, of how much reserves we think there are. And so this leads to a, a large de degree of uncertainty in the reserve volumes. However, when you move to the, the whole resource picture, so it's not just reserves which are important whenever you talk about, about oil volumes. I mentioned undiscovered. There's always estimates of how much oil is left to be discovered, and these estimates um, can vary quite widely. The production technologies for unconventional technologies are very uncertain. We don't know how much they're gonna, oil they're going to get out of the ground. There's potentially an awful lot of oil in the ground, but what percentage of that, what the recovery factor of those technologies is going to be, is not a very certain number. And when if you, well, some of the work we tried to do here was to, 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 to correlate, to bring together all of these, so to collate all of these different uncertainties in all of the different categories of oil which can make up the total oil resource base. So we have a supply cost curve here. It says how much oil on the x-axis you can get at a given cost. And it says that if in the very long term, the total amount of oil, the best estimate on, on how much oil we think it'll be is about 5.1 trillion barrels of, of oil. But the bands on this graph show the uncertainty in that number. So, so the blue band goes from the net ninth for the 5th percentile to the 95th percentile. And this uncertainty range is, is in itself goes from 3,500 to about 6,500. So the uncertainty is about 3 trillion barrels of oil. To put that into context, global production up to now has only been about, about 1.1 trillion barrels of oil. So the uncertainty itself is well over double and almost triple the amount of oil we've produced since, since the beginning of time. So this is obviously a pretty uncertain quantity whenever you're looking at how much oil can be produced. Some of the other uncertainties are, are costs. Costs have doubled quite, um, in quite a short period of time. Um, GDP, which is, on, which is down here, these are a range of projections people, different people give for, the, for where GDP is going to be in the long term. And there's a, a factor of seven difference between what, what global GDP is going to be in 2100. Similarly, population, no one knows where the population is going. If you've got more people, they're probably going to want more oil. So when you've got a range from 14 billion people to six billion people, that's a pr pretty big uncertainty. And similarly, I mentioned the, uh, the uncertainty over, over carbon trajectory and over um, technology. So what we, we tried to do here was to bring together all of these, these different sources of uncertainty and say, what effect do these have on production levels? I'm going to be a bit cheeky and not really talk in too much detail about, about the model um, which we use to produce these um, these um, scenarios, and it's a bit cheeky because I was quite critical of pre other people's attempts, but very, very briefly, it's a, it's a technology-rich model, which means it's very good at modeling demand um, variables. It's an integrated assessment model, which means it's good at taking into account carbon emissions. And it's uh, an energy system model, which means it doesn't just look at oil in isolation, it looks at the whole energy system, so coal, gas, renewables, nuclear, etc. And also, we spent quite a bit of time making sure that these depletion rate constraints, which I mentioned, are also taken into account into the model. So, what do these graphs show? So, if, if you take a central estimate for each of those different sources of uncertainty, let's say you want a three and a half degrees uh, long-term future, which is, it's, it's not as ambitious as what, what um, we want, which is two degrees. It's, it's not as bad as kind of business as usual, which is five degrees, it's somewhere in the middle. If you, and if you do similarly for the, the amount of oil you take, 
you have in the world and what costs you can get out of, you get a central scenario. And then you can run different scenarios and say, well, let's change the amount of oil there is up to the highest estimate that, that we have, or down to the lowest estimate. And what effect does that have on, on produ production levels in given years? So on the left-hand side, we have the, the, the oil production levels in 2030 um, and the effect that these different uncertainties have on, on, on oil. So CO2, if, if you move from the central estimate of, of where carbon emissions are going to be, three and, a, three and a half degrees, and you move to a two degrees future, that shifts, you, shifts the amount of oil you produce in 2030 down by about 20 million barrels per day. Similarly, if you go from a three and a half degrees future to a five degrees future, it shifts you up by about five. And similarly, in, in 2050, it, does a, uh, it tends to just extend these bars, so it has an even bigger impact on the amount of, of, of the, the, the uncertainty in, in the oil production levels. Now, the reason this is important and relevant to the big oil discussion is it just shows how difficult it is to have any confidence in any individual estimate on, on where oil production is going to be. So, the really pure academic definition of, of peak oil is the maximum level of production in a given year. But unless you're very confident on, on what's going to happen with temperatures and what's going to happen with costs and, what, and how much oil there is in the ground, you can't really say with any confidence what's going to to, to happen to oil production levels. Just take, for example, the low, the low carbon um, scenario there in 2030. Um, the central scenario roughly runs to about 100 million barrels per day in 2030. However, if you reduce that down by 20 million barrels per day, you're at 80 million barrels, which is lower than what we're currently at. So sometime between now and 2030, oil production will have peaked. But if you go to a, a high CO2 level with high demand, you're gonna be much, much higher than that level. So, these are incredibly uncertain things, so it's a bit of a, a cop-out, but one of the things that you can really these pictures tell you is that um, it's very hard to say whether peak oil under this pure academic definition is there or not, because you just can't really have any confidence in any individual production of, uh, projection of, of, of oil. Um, one other th thing just to point out very, very quickly is that I mentioned the historic focus of all of the peak oil discussion has been on resource uncertainty and unavailable and resource uncertainty. But actually, if you compare the, the, the implications of these uncertainty levels, these very high level uncertainty levels, what has the biggest effect on oil production? Actually, it's your, your assumptions on CO2 and your assumptions on, on GDP and population. Availability comes kind of a, a per fourth in this ranking of, of what, what are the, the most uh, on certain variables and w ones that have the biggest effect. So this kind of suggests that maybe some of the, the historic focus of the, the literature has been a little bit misplaced. Now, coming on to, to tight oil and what that means for all of this discussion, um, it's worth just running through briefly what we mean by tight oil. So this is produced in a very similar way to shale gas. Um, you drill down, you drill across, and you frack it, and the oil comes out. Um, the, I don't call it shale oil, which is what some people do because that can be a bit confusing um, with other sources of, of oil, so I prefer tight oil. The break-even oil price of, of this stuff is, is around about, estimated currently to be around about 60 to $80 per barrel. And there's some very key between um, conventional crude production, so production from a, a field in Iraq or in an North Sea or wherever, versus what production from, from these light tight oil fields. The first big difference, which is shown on the left here, is, is the difference in decline rate. So a tight oil, after you've fracked it, will produce an awful lot very quickly, but very, very quickly it'll, it'll decline away. So if in one year you're down at about 20% of your initial peak level, it's compared to a conventional um, field, you, it takes about 10 years to, for your, your production to decline away to this, down to this rate. The second big difference is you need an awful lot of wells. Because of this this kind of very rapid decline. You need an awful lot of wells to, to make sure that production can be maintained. So um, in some of the, the, the shale plays in, in the United States, they're producing about a million barrels of, of oil per day currently. But these, to maintain that, just to maintain that level of production, not to grow it, to maintain it requires two and a half thousand wells per year to be drilled, compared to a conventional well, or a conventional field, it, which only requires about 60 wells to be drilled. So although you, despite the fact that you've got high decline rates and you need lots of wells, these things are actually very cheap to, to drill, generally speaking, and also you can drill an awful lot in very close proximity, which means that although these things, these two things are really hurting your production 
um, dynamics, your, your production economics, sorry, you can still get the stuff out at about 60 to 80 dollars per barrel. The other really key aspect of, of tight oil is that it's come out of nowhere. No one, no one knew anything about it as, as little as four years ago. But the, the projections on where it's going to go are really quite big. So again, I've taken some of the IEA World Energy Outlooks and said, what do they think is going to happen with, with tight oil production in the future? So 2009 didn't even mention it. Uh, 2010, they said this is there's this new tight oil, which is, looks like it could, could, could be significant in the future, but we, we don't think it's going to be massive. 2011, they say, sorry, it's a bit low down, it's going to reach about a million barrels per day globally in, in the late 20s, 2020s. And then more recently, in the 2012 and 2013, this has grown really quite significantly. So they're now projecting that production levels of this tight oil are going to reach about five or six million barrels per day, which is since four years ago we knew nothing about it, that's a really quite big turnaround and it's particularly a very big turnaround for a country, an individual country. So now I want to come back to some of these other interpretations of, of peak oil and what does tight oil mean for that. Tight oil doesn't mean an awful, doesn't have a huge impact upon the academic definition of, of peak oil because we saw that that tight oil could really be seen as a, an, a resource uncertainty, a new source of, of oil which could be produced, and that doesn't have as big effect as some of the other uncertainties. So tight oil has very little effect on um, your, the conclusions which can be reached on um, a maximum level in oil production. But it does have a, a bit more of an impact upon some of these other interpretations I mentioned at the beginning of the talk about how you could see peak oil. So. This, this is an idea that we're, we're, running out of cheap, we're running out of cheap oil and we either have or are about to enter a high, high price um, oil, a high oil price regime. And what impact does tight oil have upon this? So since I keep using the IA outlooks, I'll keep going. And this is a historic price um, since, the, since the, the mid 1980s. And this is where the projections have gone for by individual um, world energy outlooks. So in 2009, when tight oil wasn't mentioned, they said we're at $100 um, dollars per barrel. And it's probably going to stay out there for the next, for the next 20 years, sub 25 years subsequently. 2010, um, when it was mentioned, but it didn't really project any massive amount of production, similar sort of level. 2011. Um, whenever we got a new million barrels of oil per day coming from this, again, no real change in, in, in oil production, in, in oil price levels. And similarly for both the 2012 and the, and the 2013 World Energy Outlook, despite the fact we've got six million barrels of per day of new production, which we weren't expecting, this made very, very little difference to any of the, the price projections. So if you compare that to, to what we had in the, in, the, um, in the 80s and in the in the early 2000s, and where people projected oil price, prices to go back then. So this is the 2004 World Energy Outlook, and that's where they, they thought the oil price was going to go over time. We're really in a very different, different kind of ballpark here, um, with three times that level. It could be argued that tight oil project, production project, projections so far are a bit, bit pessimistic, and the tight oil become a much, much bigger deal than the IEA's um, looking at so far. However, Remember, there's that, that, that minimum necessary oil price for the, for the tight oil produc production to be economic, which is about 60 to 80 dollars. So even if you've got an absolutely massive amount of, of new tight oil production, which you weren't expecting, really it's only going to bring you down to the 60 to 80 dollars per barrel level, which is still an awful lot higher than, than some of the um, projections there were 10 years ago. So really, this idea of running out of cheap oil doesn't seem to have been affected by, by the, t the tight oil um, phenomenon, if you want to call it that, at all. We're still up. We're still up in the kind of the high, high levels entirely. So I think it would be, you, couldn't, you can't really conclude from this that, that this idea of peak oil is, is dead in the slightest. We, we still, still seems to be, to be lasting. One implication that tight oil has, has had, though, is to demonstrate very, very aptly that um, this pure supply side modeling is completely finished. So I mentioned previously the curve fitting approach, and I said that I didn't think that was a particularly good idea. However, to be a bit more broader on that, actually the, the whole idea that you can model oil production in, in the future just by looking at supply side dynamics, Taito was showing that's probably not gonna, gonna be a very good idea. 
you, you, got, you get up to a, to, a, to a high price level, a new source of oil appears. That's kind of the, the reaction you'd expect of an energy system. But the, the pure supply side modeling just cannot take that into account. So I think what the title will show very, very aptly is that this, you have to take into account both supply and demand side dynamics and see what that means for the price if you want to have any confidence in, in, price pro in, in production projections. It doesn't mean that this idea that the depletion constraints, the depletion rate constraints, are, doesn't mean that they're not important. It just means that they can't be the only thing you consider. You have to consider other things as well. To, um, to come on to kind of one of the more popular ideas of what uh, what peak oil is, um, this idea that we're running out of oil. This was never really what was meant by anybody who who studied it seriously. It was kind of the more popular way of looking at things, and it was also used by a lot of people who said who just wanted to immediately dismiss peak oil is rubbish, and we're not running out of oil. And the, the argument they used is that current reserves are 1,300 um, billion barrels. That will, at current production levels, that lasts for over 40 years. When you take into account all the resource estimates, that's this five trillion, that's 150 year, years of current production. So this idea of running out of oil is complete nonsense. Peak oil is nonsense. This, is, this was never the argument that of peak oil, but this idea, these are, it's quite hard to argue with. This idea is dead, um, but it was never really alive in the first place. Um, what it does show quite aptly though is and it gives a good excuse to, to, to mention this, is that actually what we've got is far too much oil. Um, so I sh if we've got any kind of chance of staying below two degrees, we're going to have to leave some fossil fuels in the ground. And the discussions hopefully at some point will, become, will come around to which of coal, oil and gas should we leave in the ground and where is this going to be? And, this, and we can provide some insight into this idea by using um, the sorts of modeling techniques which, which we were able to come up with those um, uncertainty graphs previously. So this is uh, the, the two degree scenario, which I mentioned previously was about, reached about 80 million barrels per day. So actually it's bumbling along at that level over time and it's split by different regions. And if you compare the cumulative production of, of that oil to the reserve volumes, it tells you how much oil we need to use to, and how much or how much that is compared to reserves, and which while still maintaining a good chance of staying below two degrees. So 1,300 billion barrels of oil, um, so 1,300 billion barrels of oil, and a third of that can't be used before 2035 if we're gonna have a good chance of staying below two degrees. And this modeling shows that actually most of this lies in the, in the Middle East. So you can get, so the argument is not that we've got, we're running out of oil, um, the argument is we've got far too much oil, and that we need to do something about that. Um, what this also demonstrates is that a lot of in, in environmental lobbyists took up the idea of peak oil as, and championed it as a reason to, to move away from oil-based transport and so on, to move on to lo other low-carbon sources. But this kind of shows that actually that's, that's not a very good idea, and it never was a particularly good idea. High oil prices don't mean that it's good to move away from low carbon sources necessarily. It encourages you to produce new, new sources of oil, and we don't want to do that if we're going to stay below two degrees. Could you explain what you were saying? The blue is the unburned. Yep. And you're saying how much of that ought not to be burned for two degree rise? So let's, if we take the, the Middle East there, for example, it's got 387 plus 302 billion barrels of oil. And you can say that 387 of that can't be burnt if you're going to have a chance of staying below two degrees. But you can, it, can, it can produce 300 billion barrels. In Europe, in contrast, has its current reserves are about 30 billion barrels, and you can produce all of that if you want to. So, so the brown is what what's they can produce for two degrees? Yep, yeah, so the red is what you, you can produce, and blue is what you can't produce. Right. Sorry, should have been. No meaning to the diameters. Sorry? No meaning to the diameters. No, they should all be the same. Apartments up to, which need to be bigger. <laughs> so, um, coming towards the end now, um, the very last definition of peak oil was, was this idea that demand is going to exceed supply at some point. And the logic behind this was, um, is, is quite simple, is that if you look back in the, on, in the past, since 2000, pretty much without fail apart from the recession, oil, oil demand has always increased. So that's probably going to continue in the future, and let's say it, it continues out of that level. Now the, the supply of 
new projects coming online tend to take a long time, so, the, so this argument goes. And so you can say in a given year, well, we know when new production is going to, going to occur, and we know where this is going to occur, because it must have been announced already. For the next five years, there's no new projects which have come online, which, which we can't already know about. And when you, you add up all of those new projects which are coming online, and you take away the, the, the amount of oil which you're going to lose from declining um, declines in existing fields, that gives you an overall production cap as to the maximum level of supply you get between now and, and a given year. And the argument went that whenever these two lines cross, you're in a bit of trouble because your, your demand now wants to be much higher than it can be, and so you get a massive price spike. That wasn't always the one conclusion that people gave, but it, it was that's often how it was interpreted that this, you get a crunch whenever this, these two lines cross, which leads to a massive price spike. Um, this was, again, never a particularly sensible argument to, to, to give, mainly because as you're, if, if, if this is correct and if you can um, accurately project all oil uh, production projects they're going to be, as people see that the oil market's getting very tight, you're going to get a you're going to get a steady price rise. Then you're not going to get a massive price spike whenever the two things meet, and you're going to get some price signal sent onto both both sides. So there are some short term supply new supply projects you can bring online if you want to if you're willing to pay for it. And there's also some demand side mechanisms you can use to reduce production. So, th so you're never going to get a massive price spike. But what tight oil shows whenever you get a completely new source of production which you weren't expecting is that actually you also can't even you can't even get to the level where you, you rent any confidence in, in the new uh, production project which are online. So out of nowhere, tight oil, this is, this is adding on the, the IEA, latest IEA outlook on where tight oil is going to go. And so if you add that on to the amount of, the, of projects that were projected, then um, first of all, your, your, your crunch time is pushed back and also your... Uh, it just demonstrates that you can't really um, model this kind of stuff with any confidence. So just to conclude, um, come back to the original question, is peak oil dead? Well, that completely depends by, by what you mean by peak oil. In the, in the purest sense, uh, in the academic sense, wh which is in the maximum level of production, we don't know whether it's dead or not. I think it's too hard to, to have any confidence, any single projection on, on where oil or production is going to be that we can't say when it's going to, to peak. We only know once it's happened, if it does happen, um, along that it happened, you know, 10 years ago. You're not going to know in the future because it's such a hard thing to do. If your interpretation of peak oil is that we're running out of cheap oil, that, I don't think that's dead. That's, it still seems to be that we're in a high price regime and this, is, this, is set, this looks like it's set to last for quite a while. And even then, the, the price floor set by, by tight oil, if there's a huge new explosion, isn't. Um, is, isn't as low as it has been historically. Doesn't mean that prices aren't going to fall in the future, but it means that tight oil in itself hasn't hasn't led to a, to a, a catastrophic or a massive decline in in oil in oil prices. And finally, the two the two more popular definitions or interpretations of what peak oil means that are running out of oil and you're going to get supply crunch. Both of those are dead, um, but it wasn't tight oil that killed them. They were they were always dead, they were never alive in the first place. And I'll finish there. Thank you. <laughs> 46. Thank you very much, Mr. So, uh, we've got opportunity for questions. Um, can you just please say uh, where your name is? The only one can have a really brilliant lens or something. I think that's a very fair summary, Mr. What I would say is that the price inflation model has been going on from the very beginning. In California, we originally stick to the ground in all the time. As each new resource came along, whether it's Saudi or whatever else, offshore, the price of production has gone up. But the amount of oil available has gone up with it. And, and I've disagreed with you about the title coming out of the blue. The technology has actually taken several decades to develop in the States. So we know it's coming on. I agree with you the, the amount, perhaps, I'd like to make an analogy with, with um, uranium. Um, you can get supplies of uranium at 10 percent uh, uh, of the the, the oil mass. Uh, in Canada, for example, there are a few tens of thousands of, of, of uh, um, ore available in that kind of level. Most of it is less than one percent. Uh, 
But if you go to the sea, it's three parts per billion, but the resources are a thousand times greater. It also would cost the estimate of the world is about ten times higher cost to produce compared to the, the moon land. So it's an economic resource. That's, that's what really the definition is about. And Dieter Helm has been a bit naughty still gas fan about saying that the, the economic price is really what we're interested in. Is there a question? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> just to point out that may, maybe we actually do know what people mean, but we haven't framed the question. Quite, but you're, you're quite possibly right. <coughs> I agree with you on all everything that you said. Um, just to, to mention on one thing on, on the cost side of side of things. Yes, in at the beginning of time, it was. When of the beginning of the oil age, it was very, very cheap to, to produce stuff. But I don't think you can, can say that costs, costs have always increased. I mean, it's, I, I, I mentioned very briefly kind of that cost index, which only shows since 2000. And there was a really rapid increase, a doubling in three years of the amount of uh, the cost of producing a given barrel of oil. I'll show it very quickly. So this is, this is the capital cost index of producing a, a given barrel of oil. So in 2000, it's taken as 100. 2005, you were at 120. And by, by the end of 2008, you'd... you'd well, it's, 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 the, it's, it's the average cost of producing a barrel of oil. And there wasn't a huge shift between 2006 and 2008. The trading costs or the cost of the production. It's the That's a very different. It's, it's, about it's the capital. It's the investment cost. It's the, the investment cost index. What mean investment cost? Absolutely, but the production, global production, didn't change massively. It's not as if you had a, you know, a, a huge, you, the unconventional oil sands, for example. Expected to because production is not economic, depending on the demand. That's true, but it doesn't doesn't. You mean the selling price, or is actual the cost incurred to the company? The capital cost, the cost of production. So, so it might not be the clear thing, but can you just have, do you want to just have a shot at answering that comment? Um, the, the point I was I was leading to say here is that for a, for a given barrel of oil, even if even if, if nothing else changes, um, the cost can change. Sorry, I shouldn't say nothing changes. Even if you don't, if you have a bar barrel of oil which you know you can get out of the ground. Other factors play into what what cost you think you can get out of that barrel of oil out of the ground. And what I showed in the right here, I didn't really discuss, was there's a very close correlation between the oil price and cost of production. Now, it doesn't, this doesn't say there's, there's there's causation between these two, but there are some good causal links which which can relate the oil price to to the cost of production. Most economists wouldn't like you to say that, but if take the oil sands for example, the oil price spikes suddenly, a lot of oil in, in the oil sands becomes potentially economic to produce. So what what they need to do is get as many people over in there as possible. It's a very intensive process, so you need to get manpower in there to produce this stuff. Now, no one really want, wants to go necessarily up to the. Um, the north of, of, of Canada, so therefore you've got to pay them a lot to get there. So your costs have gone up driven by the price of oil. So although a, for a given barrel of oil producing the oil sands, your costs have gone up. And that's just the point that's just trying to make its costs are uncertain. E and, but I, 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 um, I take away everything you said. I think we're going to have to move on very quickly. That's one very I'm a student here at UCL. I'd like to ask you about uh, unburned oil. You mentioned about a third of current reserves will need to remain unburned if we are to remain within uh, COP 17 targets. But there seems to be a popular figure in the press of uh, four bits of current reserves. Um, where does this disparity between the figures arise from, and how does that affect the discussion of oil pricing? Um. The discussion in in what you mentioned is that is for fossil fuel reserves. So. The, I was only focusing on oil here, so um, whenever you, you, you say you want to get below two degrees, what really needs to take the hit is coal. And so, although on, our, on average, on a carbon basis, if you would convert all coal and all gas and all oil into just a carbon metric, 
and how much of that you can burn while staying off in two degrees, you get a third. However, coal takes the big hit of that. I think it's, if you can use a similar, the model to tell you how much unburnable coal there is, and that's kind of close to 95%, because what you've got to do is get rid of coal from the energy system. Oil is much, much harder to displace. Um, it's a very useful quantity, especially for transport. And so you, you, tend, you use a greater proportion of the, of the oil than, than you do of the coal. So we can try small better than knowing that it will be less affected by the Kyoto targets rather Relative to coal. Um, just to um, project us on the demand side story, um, we've seen demand decline steadily for some years now in the US. Um, we've seen uh, a growth, rapid growth in electric vehicles. Uh, this really from still to a very low level. Um, uh, I haven't driven a couple of months, or so I'm not a fan of this, better than the question, so it's still not a um, um, how far do you think, that, well, given transport is the core market and a large proportion of that is like it, um, how far do you think, uh, has your, if you like, I'm, I'm asking if you've been graphs like that in your model with uh, uh, the effect of, I suppose, that's both the technology and the demand and the CO2 yeah. sort of an issue in looking at possible downside. Um, again, I mean, this, this comes out of the idea that oil is, oil is so useful that. Um, it's, it's a very hard thing to push out of the transport system. But if, if it, within the, the TR model, it, 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 it does the, the well, if you want to reach a certain carbon budget or a certain, le certain, certain level of c carbon mitigation, it'll do the cheapest things first. The cheapest thing to do is always decarbonize your electricity sector. That's the first thing you do, more or less before you touch transport. Because cars are very expensive, people value them very highly, and, and they like using oil to do that. So the model is, is quite pessimistic on the levels of um, of kind of uptake of new hydrogen cars or electric cars or even even hybrid cars because it just there's 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 cheaper things and kind of more pressing things to do before you kind of start to touch transport. Yeah, it's all very good. Um, I am Sam Roberts from Arab. I was the editor of the Epos report that you put up there. Moving on from that work, uh, we convened a meeting in, uh, in December, which was of experts in London and Washington to really get to grips with uh, the long-term projections for the tight oil. And we just advertised that on Jeremy Leggett's site, he's got the transcript and the presentations from the Canadian work, and uh, someone who used to be in Deutsche Bank. So if you just look at Jeremy Leggett's site, you'll see it's got the transcript and the presentation. Okay. Uh, because you're quite right that the game was changed by the title. And it's quite important then to probe beneath and I would caution against continuing to put up the IEA, given that you've shown how.